We recognize that CVUUS gathers on land seized from the Western Abenaki by European colonizers. We respect the Abenaki's spiritual relationship to the land and waters of the Champlain Valley. We are committed to building a peaceful and more just relationship with them and to promoting knowledge about their history and culture. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to CVUUS, Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society. Who are we? We are a church that sustains a liberal religious tradition, aspires to be visible and active on behalf of social justice and environmental responsibility, nurtures and empowers us all at all ages on our spiritual journeys, and reaches out to the larger communities of which we are a part. It's good that we are here together. We're glad that you have braved the cold, and chosen to spend part of your day with us on this wintry last Sunday in the year's shortest month. <clears throat> in a few days, next Wednesday, we will turn the calendar to March. I have often testified that the least pleasant months in Vermont in the year are November and March. But March is better because April and May follow. <laughs> and they are playing baseball now in Florida and Arizona. <laughs> and that's a sign of renewal and hope. You do know that baseball is a holy enterprise. <laughs> the Christian Bible actually begins with the words, in the big inning. At any rate, <clears throat> we hope you find here today something which nourishes your spirit. I'm Carl Lindholm, a member of the worship team, and I'm assisted Esther Charleston and Tom Morgan today, members of the congregation, who are leading us on this last Sunday in Black History Month in a service called Questions and Callings. Thank you, Tom and Esther. You will perhaps note that Francois Clemens is not with us today. He is lending his voice to a service at the college at this time. Well, I hope we get a video recording of that and we'll put it in the blast next week. It's a good time to turn off your phone. If you haven't done so already, I never mind being reminded of that because I have suffered that embarrassment myself. Uh, if you're visiting, please sign the guest book in the foyer so we can send you news of activities and events that enrich our time together. And all, do stay after the service for snacks and friendly conversation downstairs in the Ann Ross Fellowship Room. If you have a milestone or passage today that you would like to share, fill out a yellow card, and, which are available out in the foyer, and place it in the basket during the offering. There are many pathways to connection here at UCVUS, activities and events in addition to Sunday services that bring us together as a community. And they're very, there's many of them are listed today in your order of service, so do read them in your order, order of service. And when you get the weekly blast on Wednesday, they are much amplified, and so pay attention to the weekly blast, do. Let us today worship together. Our gathering song is Voice Still and Small, number 391 in the gray hymnal, or it will be also on the screen. Please stand as you're able.
testimony. Also, Margie and Jordan tell us that they're feeling much better. You will note, I think, in the presentation that they have a bit of a cold. My name is Ollie Coltrara, and my pronouns are they, them. This testimony is the first in a series as part of this year's Canvas. When I moved to Vermont four and a half years ago, CVU US became an important landing place for me. I was warmly welcomed to the community and quickly became involved in congregational life. Having this space on Sunday mornings to get in touch with what's on my heart helped me find my way as a young adult in a new town, as a recent college graduate starting a career, and as a queer person going through a gender transition. Through all this change, CVU US has been a place I can land and be replenished. I've also seen and felt how much room we have to grow. There are aspects of my experience as a queer and trans person that are not reflected back to me at CVU US. I know people of color have experiences of erasure, microaggressions, and feeling out of place in a white dominant culture here too. For my first couple years here, I didn't join CVU US as a member because I didn't know if I would be staying in the area. But an equally important reason I didn't join was because joining felt like making a statement of personal responsibility. If I wanted to claim membership in this community, then I would be responsible for helping give life the shape of justice here in our congregation. During the pandemic, I took a big step back. As COVID restrictions waned and I emerged back into the larger world, I prioritized other relationships, communities, and outlets that were nourishing to me. But when I returned to the sanctuary for the in-gathering service this past September, I felt like I had landed again. There's a type of nourishment that I received from this community that is unlike anything else. I realized CVU US doesn't need to be everything for me, just like I don't need to be everything to anyone. But together we share, and from this we live. I did finally join as a member this fall, but mostly for the voting privileges. I realized that not joining was not absolving me of any responsibilities was already in relationship with this community, and a reciprocal relationship requires receiving and giving. I'm looking forward to seeing how my relationships at CVU US will continue to grow and change. And as long as this community is a place I come to land, I will have something to give. Good morning. My name is Ali Coltrara, and my pronoun Reprise. <laughs> Seeing you all here makes me proud to live in Vermont. This snowy, cold day. Welcome all who come in grace and peace. Welcome all who come to care. Welcome all with burdens to release. Welcome all with love to share. Welcome all who come to unify. Welcome all who come in light. Welcome all who come to diversify. Welcome all joining the fight. Welcome all with thoughts to evolve. Welcome all that feel some fear. Welcome all puzzles to be solved. Welcome all with hearts open to hear. Welcome all. And now the chalice lighting. Good morning. I'm a little shorter than everybody else, so. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our hearts deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and welcoming of multiple truths. As you know, each week we split our offering with an organization or entity doing good in our community or in the world our donee for this month, fitting as the war in Ukraine passed the one-year mark this past week, 
is Rezom for Ukraine, a U.S.-based charity run by Ukrainian and Ukrainian-American volunteers and provides a critical humanitarian war relief and recovery depending upon the most urgent needs as they evolve. Last Sunday, as you recall, we saw a very compelling video describing their fundraising and relief efforts. Do be as generous as you can. We acknowledge important events and concerns with one another by writing them on these yellow cards. There are milestones and passages. We have a yellow card from Ellen Flight. And she writes, I'm thinking of Jimmy Carter and his family as he is in hospice care at home reminded of all his humanitarian work across the world in the years after his presidency. I remember voting for Jimmy Carter in the 70s. I think it was the second or third time I was able to vote. I liked the man. D. Carroll writes, <clears throat> CVUUS friends are invited to a tribute to Charles Sabukowitz at the residence at Otter Creek on Friday, March 3rd in the Founders Room at 3 p.m. Dennis O'Brien will read selections of Charlie's poetry. We look forward to seeing you. Charlie was a longtime member here and a, quite, a, quite a wonderful poet. Some of you may recognize the name Dennis O'Brien. He now lives in Middlebury. He was the Dean of Men when I was a student at Middlebury. And because he did so well with me, he went on to be president at Bucknell <laughs> and then at the University of Rochester. And now he's residing there at the residence. <laughs> um, and uh, it's this, actually the same yellow card. For, uh, Barnaby wanted to make sure that I did it. His wife, Helen Marsh, uh, will be there as, as, is that right, Barnaby, as well. Charlie and his wife, wife Helen Marsh, a former resident of CVUS. In addition to his poetry, Charlie was a longtime public school teacher in Middlebury. So I think that would be, it would be good to see a number of us there. 
No doubt there are other milestones and passages, joys and concerns that reside in our hearts and minds today. today. So let's now join in a brief time of meditation, silent meditation or prayer. Now, please stand as you're able to sing number 1021 in the Teal Hymnal, the familiar song, Lean on Me. Some of you may remember, if you go back away, that it was popularized by the great singer Bill Withers, who was a Middlebury parent a couple of decades ago, and we enjoyed his presence on campus on a number of occasions singing just this song. Thank mm -hmm. you.
as we sang that song, the tears already started flowing. <laughs> I'm gonna need to lean on you all as we do this service. Save space, an illusion, a magical myth, a place to suffer silently, your free expression, my oppression, your privilege, my pain. Step lightly, remind gently, disarm, yet do no harm. Hold safe space so all are heard and none are hurt. Hold the tongue so none are heard and all are hurt. Brave space, a hope, a prayer, a wish, a place where words are spoken Tears shed, hearts rendered. And dreams realized. Shared space, now feel unsafe. Growth demand new depths of comprehension wide birth for acceptance, tougher skin, steel-toed boots, to shield our weary, marching, stepped on feet. Sanctuary for unconditional love, replete with conditions. Your building up might tear me down you're tearing me down might kill me. What foundations exist to fill the voids? Crowd out the noise to make this space, to make this place, this space beloved. If love holds power, how much will it take to be loved, breathe love, be loved, beloved, in this beloved space? Jan Carpenter Tucker gives us some profound observations in her poem. Then she asks questions. If love holds power, how much will it take to be love, breathe love, be loved in this beloved space? There is a story behind Tucker's questions. In her story, it is her story, offered that we might be moved by it. One of the things I love most about this congregation is your stories, not stories from the media or academia, but the stories that you embody, that you carry with you, like Jan Carpenter Tucker's questions. Those questions that come from these stories are the ones that most often lead to generative change. Stories with questions that call, launch, and sustain our boldest, most selfless actions. So as we wrap up our February theme of Black History Matters, Esther and I have brought some stories that opened us up with questions and interrogated our values and called us to take actions. On Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday last month, Reverend Barnaby reminded us of Dr. King's aspiration of beloved community 
and the inescapable network of mutuality. Those ideas echo in our UU values and principles. Our first principle of the inherent worth and dignity of everyone, our second principle of justice, equity, and compassion, and the sixth principle of world community and justice for all, and of course the proposed eighth principle. Reverend Forrest Gilmore of the Shalom Center in Indiana reminds us that our seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence, is a glorious statement as well. Yet we make a profound mistake when we limit it to merely an environmental idea because it is so much more. It is our response to the great dangers of both individualism and oppression. It is our solution to the seeming conflict between the individual and the group. Our intent today is not to continue our discussion about our principles. But we do think that Reverend Gil, Gil Moore's advice to not forget that we are a part of a covenant calling us to be present in the independent web is profoundly comforting. Unitarian Universalist beliefs and values are by design unifying and connecting and love centric. Now, let's return to our theme of questions that whisper or shout a call to action. In its amazing little book, Blue Notes, the group Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism writes, we do not necessarily need to have shared beliefs as much as we need a shared commitment to act in a world where we are not yet free. Blue asks these questions. Do your beliefs point you to liberation for black people and all people? Do your beliefs point you to liberation, compassion, love, and justice? Do your beliefs foster communal well-being? Do your beliefs call you to action that prioritizes humanity as only one part of a complex web of existence? Do your beliefs invite you to love folks in the fullness of their complex identity? What questions have called you to deeper commitment and action? Tom and I will share some of ours, but first, a cautionary note. The stories you are about to hear are the stories from the parents of black children. Sufferers of white fragility will be triggered. The question of my first story is, what if this was my child? The January 10th murder of Tyree Nichols on a Memphis street has generated all sorts of emotions and opinions. Listening to the media, you might think that every decent person in America was shocked that an unarmed black man was murdered in the streets. Just like we were shocked when the police killed George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Philandros Castile, Freddie Gray, Eric Gardner, Tamir Rice, Taisha Anderson, Dante Wright, Andre Hill, Manuel Ellis, Atatiana Jefferson, Ora Rozier, Stefan Clark, Botham Jean, Alton Sterling, Janisha Fonville, Michelle Casso, Akai Gurley, 
Gabriela Navarez, Richard Ward, and many, many others. On the Sunday after the video release of Tyree Nichols' death, my family really needed to hear a black voice preach. So we went to hear guest pastor Rodney Patterson at the first UUS in Burlington. Pastor Patterson is the founder of Vermont's only black church, the New Alpha Missionary Baptist Church in Burlington. Pastor Patterson talked about Dr. King's perspective on beloved community and how his vision was not limited to anti-racism, it's an anti-ism vision. Dr. King was as anti-classist as he is anti-racist. Pastor Patterson gently reminded us that the power dynamics that have governed and policed America for the past 400 years have systematically created conditions, institutions, and behaviors that resist beloved community, just as some people resist the proposition that black lives matter. Dr. King said these folks can fit into three categories, the arrogant, folks that consider themselves and their groups better than others, the ignorant, uninformed people who lack knowledge and therefore makes them oblivious and renders them workless in the cause of justice, and then the category Dr. King called the most dangerous, the complacent. Good people who see and know but do not do. Dr. King said, quote, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence by the good. And he also said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Dr. King's vision was about faith and things that matter. He preached that we are all individually created with a divine light that is not separate from some distant divinity or static image of a white god, but created with a unifying power to act and reshape the conditions in which we live. When I see Tyree Nichols, I see the face of my child. When Irena heard Tyree cry for his mother as he was being beaten, she heard him calling for her. When I see Michael Brown laying on, the Can laying on Canfield Street in Ferguson, Missouri for four hours, I see the body of my child. The stories of Dr. King, of Tyree, Michael, Brianna, George, Tamir, and all these beautiful spirits have to confirm to us that we cannot dismantle systematic oppression from a distance. If we are going to achieve beloved community, we have to do more than intellectualize or opinionize injustice. We will have to expend our privileges, take some risks, and go into some intersections. We are accountable for the actions we take or fail to take to live into our principles because love holds power. And we are going to have to exercise our faith and the power of love if we are going to remake a world fit for a beloved community. As Tom stated, yes, all these stories of beautiful spirits tell us we cannot dismantle systemic oppression from a distance. For me as a black woman in this space, I have asked myself, should I hide or should I stand? A Haitian American woman born to immigrant parents Anita and Glasha Chalestin, the oldest of five incredible siblings, mother to two beautiful souls, and a wife to an amazing partner. I see and hear stories of justice, injustice, calls to action, and I have asked myself, 
Should I hide or take a stand? When I speak about the hidden life, I mean living a life that refuses to acknowledge the truth about being black in this country. For years, I believed in assimilation. With immigrant parents, that was easy as I was taught, this is the white man's land. We are here to create a better life for our families to build on the opportunities our parents sacrificed for. And I did just that. I went to college, grad school, and learned how to navigate white spaces. I thought myself better because of it. I thought myself better because of it. Oh, how naive I was. In June 2020, the murder of George Floyd, the pandemic, and the time to think allowed me to sit with the truths that I fought so hard to ignore. The fear that I fought so hard to ignore. The fear I have for my black children the fear that I cannot protect my black children from the way the world sees them, the fear I have for myself. Do I allow the constant fear to take hold? So I leaned on a poem that most of you may know. If not, I can't wait to introduce you to Marianne Williamson, Our Deepest Fear. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. With that, I recognize when people see me, the first thing they see is a black woman. I recently started a new job in town as the Dean of Climate and Culture at our local middle school. That job is hard, that job is tough, and I love it. Part of the work that I do involves walking the halls and checking different spaces where students can hide and encourage them to make it to class. On this particular day, I was doing a walkthrough and entered a space where a student said, hey, Dean Charleston, come see this. On the wall, I saw, I hate niggas, Dean. I was in denial. I was like, they could not be talking about me. <laughs> They're not talking about me. We have a seventh grader with the same name. And then it hit me. I am the only black adult working in this school. And all referred to me as Dean Charleston. I became numb. I was reminded that I live in a racist community, that a lot of people fear me because I'm black. 
the fear came back tenfold. Again, I had to ask myself, do I hide or do I stand? The question uh, from my second story is, junkies, aren't we all? I met the prophet Raymond in a homeless shelter. Our congregation in the D.C. area prepared and served meals for homeless folks that would sleep in our fellowship hall at night. On this Friday night, after everyone had been served, I sat across the, from this tall, tired, middle-aged black man with soft eyes, sitting at the end of a table. We engaged in small talk about the weather and food. He asked about my family. I shared a bit about my older girls who live out west and the ones at home, Wesley and Amaya. And he asked if I had any pictures. So I shared one of my favorites that's on my phone. He looked down at the picture, looked back up at me, looked down at the picture again, and smiled. Then Raymond reached in his pocket and said, can I show you my kids? Of course, I said. I, I, he, he gently uh, I handed me his phone, his beat-up phone, and through the cracked screen, I saw two well-dressed, smiling 20-somethings, Raymond's son and daughter. His son was an elementary school teacher in D.C., and his daughter was an attorney. Raymond told me that he hadn't been in contact with them in years, but he'd heard that his daughter was about to have a baby. You must be very proud, I said. Still looking at the picture, Raymond paused and sighed. I don't deserve any credit. That goes to their mama. I'm just a junkie. I'm just a junkie. Time stopped in that moment for me. I was in what the Greeks call Kairos time. The resignation, shame, and disgrace that Raymond intended just hung there, dispossessed, almost like a jump ball in a basketball game, tossed up and waiting for someone to take it. And then I heard my voice say, aren't we all, Raymond? Aren't we all? Our conversation continued and I learned more about Raymond's life. A professional accountant that fell prey to addiction, he lost his job, then his house, and then his family. All along the way, he tried to get help. Everything moved so fast. One day, he was picking up his shirts from the laundry and it seemed like the next, he was panhandling outside the same store. He couldn't find any help. His church helped him for a while, but eventually he just became, as he says, another homeless black man on the streets. Black Americans, 13% of the U.S. population, make up 40% of our homeless population. But the rate of homelessness among black Americans is likely much higher due to a systematic statistical method used by the government called unsheltered homelessness. Statistics on homelessness do not often count people living in shelters who are disproportionately BIPOC, and they absolutely do not count foster children who are disproportionately BIPOC. So we really don't fully comprehend the problem. How does this happen? In this country filled with faith communities and wealth, faith communities that claim to lead with love, how does this happen? It happens the same way 30,000 children age out of America's foster care system every year without a family. Over half those kids will spend the rest of their lives in poverty, and many of them will be incarcerated, but the foster care to prison pipeline is a topic for another day. My time with Raymond, just like my time spent with other prophets, changed me. I question my perspectives, my habits, my fixes, my attachments that created illusions of comfort for me, but suffering for others. 
more aware of my own attachments, I could better see the systematic injustices constructed by white supremacy, privilege, greed, and egocentrism. In her book, Radical Dharma, Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams writes that white supremacy has not only robbed black and brown people of their liberty and dignity, it has programmed and policed white people into systematically believing who they should love and who they should fear. White supremacy enabled not only the categorization but the systemization of groups into a hierarchy of worthiness. From slavery to Jim Crow to segregation to redlining, racism has caused white people's ability to love universally to wither. Williams writes, for generation after generation, white America has traded humanity for privilege. As Jan Carpenter Tucker's poem says, love holds power. In the context of love, Raymond is not the rightful owner of his shame and disgrace. He is just a tenant in a complex system of injustices. Raymond was sick. He was sick from being commoditized, dehumanized, and disenfranchised. As long as I remained in denial of my own addictions, my own comforts, and illusions of security, as long as I depended on a vocabulary born of hegemony and difference, I was a shareholder in the franchise that maintained his otherness and his degradation. So my questions have brought me here to make some trades in my own life, to live what Reverend Williams refers to as embodied intersectionality. If you are really seeking liberation, sometimes you have to go sit with the beloved in some intersections. As one of my mentors and the renowned womanist, the Reverend Dr. Joanne Terrell says, benevolence is one thing, liberation is something else entirely. Churches talk a lot about hope, but as Dr. King knew, hope is not a course of action. It is helpful for, to, for me to remember that Dr. King wrote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, from the Birmingham jail, not from behind a computer screen in a cozy office or in a sanctuary. If we are going to be true to our principles and commitment to mutuality, if we are going to dismantle the systems and structures that create the conditions of hopelessness, racism, classism, heterosexism, xenophobia, ageism, ableism, we have to move beyond intellectualizations. We need to be, move beyond identity politics because love holds power. Marianne Williamson is right. We are powerful beyond measure. May we not fear that power, but harness it for our journey toward wholeness. As we travel, may we know what Cornell West refers to as subversive joy. May we be brave and expend our privileges so that beloved community is realized in this radically diverse and beautiful plurality of creation. I was groomed to make white people feel comfortable. It was the way I measured my success for so long and a strategy I use to raise my children. Is that good, bad, indifferent? I don't know. I know if they were able to navigate white spaces, if they weren't able to navigate white spaces, it would be a hindrance for them. I've witnessed black people not get the job, lose opportunities for advancement, and get fired because of it. Now, 
as I embrace my blackness, my kinks, my curls, my dark chocolate skin, I ask myself the second question. Do I limit myself the way the world limits me, or do I walk in my purpose beyond my blackness? In November 2020, my divorce was recently finalized. I was in a space of believing all things are possible. I'm a dreamer. So as I was filling in my ballot for elections, I decided to write my name in the ballot, because why not? I chuckled to myself, and I mailed it in. <laughs> I had lunch with a friend who was like, Esther, I saw your name on the ballot. And I was like, really? Who could have written that? I did not tell her at the time it was me. Um, and she was like, that was great. I mean, would you ever consider running for select board? And I was like, what select board? <laughs> I had a long way to go. The single mother who moved to Vermont with two kiddos, no family or friends, new job in a predominantly white space, no longer wanted to hide. But to be a part of the shift here and making Middlebury home. So I figured it out. I found out what the select board was and is. I attended a few meetings and decided to run. And I ran twice. And last March was the top vote getter. Come on, we're going we to celebrate that. We're going to celebrate that. And I must say, that was a victory. Unexpected, honestly, I cried, called my mama. <laughs> but I'm also reminded that the odds are still against me. And the odds were against me at the time, but I did it anyway. It was hard, and the obstacles were there and are still there. I had to step down over the summer because I could not find housing in Middlebury. At that time. And six months later, I'm back. <laughs> and I choose to stand knowing there will be ups and downs. I will continue to be an active member in this community. And let me tell you, I'm usually scared I'm figuring it out as I go. I'm staying true to my roots, to my inner voice, walking unashamed in my blackness, knowing and leaning on those that came before me who took a stand. My grandmother's prayers my, and my grandfather's dreamings, the breath of my ancestors, the spirit of God, I am the result of prayers, dreams, visions, and actions. You are the result of prayers, dreams, visions, and actions. My ask is that you take action. In you taking action, working through your whiteness, letting go of fear, you will unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As you are liberated from your own fear, your presence will automatically liberate others. As I choose to stand, I pray and believe that those who come after me will be my prayers answered, my dreams fulfilled, and have my breath as they move forward. Now, let us sing the final hymn, Spirit of Life, number 123 in the Gray Hymnal.
If love holds power, how much will it take to be love, breathe love, be loved, beloves, in this beloved space, blessed be. Thank you.